preparing now, so it should come up in a second. Okay. And here we go. I can see myself on our live stream, which means we are now live. Nice to have all of you joining us. Those of you who are on this side of the pond, welcome to yet another online talk of the week. And for those of you who have already told me you'll be joining from Canada, welcome and good morning because Canada, this particular part of Ontario is five hours behind. So it's bright and sunny. I'm just getting the, suns up, the thumbs up from my beautiful assistant who is watching the live stream from downstairs. I'm here this afternoon, this morning with Rabbi Larry Englander, and he's going to uh, have to sit still and listen to me say a whole bunch of really nice things about him. So if you, <laughs> if you start blushing, you can always just turn your camera off for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rabbi Lawrence Englander is the founding rabbi of Salel Congregation in Mississauga, Ontario, where he served from its inception in 1973 until his retirement in June 2014. During his tenure, Salel established itself as a vibrant community with a commitment to liturgical innovation, education, and progressive Zionism. His inspirational leadership led Salel to become a founding synagogue of two Mississauga-based charitable organizations, the Mississauga Food Bank, which was originally called Food Path, and Pathway, a charity that seeks to provide decent and affordable housing. He was recognized for his longstanding commitment to social justice when he was appointed a member of the Order of Canada in 2005. If all that weren't enough, Rabbi Englander also has a tremendous reputation as a scholar. He received his doctorate of Hebrew letters from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in 1984 in the field of Jewish mysticism and rabbinics. He has taught in the religious studies department at York University and spent a semester teaching rabbinical students at Leo Beck College. He has written several articles on Jewish mysticism as well as a book, The Mystical Study of Ruth, Midrash Hane'alam of the Zohar to the Book of Ruth, published by Scholars Press. And he's also a former editor of the Central Conference of American Rabbis Journal. All of these accolades aside, and on a personal note, he is also one of the loveliest people I've ever met. He officiated at my baby naming, my bat mitzvah, and he ordained me. So much of what I try to bring to the rabbinate has been shaped by Rabbi Englander, and it is such a treat to be able to have him as a guest today. And our topic gives us an opportunity to delve into one of Rabbi Englander's greatest passions, Israel and the many different peoples and cultures who call her home. So before we get on to our topic, I know that Larry has something he's hoping to plug, which sounds like an amazing thing that we can all get involved in no matter where we're based. So Larry, please, if you would tell us about the thing you've got coming up that sounds very exciting. All right, thank you, Rabbi Emily. And before I even do that, I have to say what an honor and a privilege it is to uh, be hosted by a former student and a rather brilliant one at that. So uh, 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 Edgeware and Hinton Reform are, are extremely fortunate. Uh, to have you uh, as a member of their clergy, and I hope they know that. I'm sure they do. <laughs> uh, even though we meet you over here, we know that you're doing wonderful things uh, in the UK, so that's great. Thank you. Um, you, you were talking about uh, my passion for Israel and Zionism, and one of the things I guess we've all learned lately is that we know that we've been hit by the COVID-19 virus, certainly in Canada, the UK, throughout the world. And uh, the Jewish communities uh, are certainly bearing the, the brunt of that in terms of loss of finance, loss of programming, uh, compromises all over to try and cope with this uh, pandemic. We discovered that as bad as we feel it's hitting us, in Israel, it's even multiplied. It's as if they've been hit with the perfect storm. Uh, not only the pandemic, 
but there's been growing uh, religious intolerance. The mayor of Jerusalem, of all people, uh, recently said that there is no place for reformed Jews at the Western Wall, at the Kotel. Just unconscionable, but he gets away with saying that. We have to make sure that he doesn't. Um, then there's also the fact that the, there's been a swing to the right in terms of political allegiance, both within the Knesset and within the World Zionist Organization. And the reform movement in Israel depends on funding from both of those organizations, especially the WZO. And so they really have a serious shortfall of, uh, of funding. So a few of us in Canada got together and we said, maybe it's time for us diaspora reform Jews to step up to the plate and to help our, our movement because I firmly believe that the Israel movement for reform and progressive Judaism is really the lifeblood of the Jewish state uh, in terms of the energy that it puts into it, but also in terms of the values, uh, spiritual and ethical that uh, it instills into uh, the state of Israel. And that's why if we support them, we're really going to reap the benefits ourselves. So we devised a, a program, a broadcast program. It's going to be on uh, the Canadian Council for Reform Judaism uh, website. Uh, Emily, I sent you the flyer just a little while ago, which you know, feel free to share. And it's going to be broadcast on June the 18th, the Thursday evening, 7.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So obviously that's half past midnight in, in the UK, but it is going to be recorded. And if you want to get a hold of the recording, you can uh, play it at any time you wish uh, to your own congregation. Uh, there's going to be some amazing entertainment on it. We've got... Um, musicians, both from Canada and from Israel in, in both reform movements, sometimes singing together, thanks to mm -hmm. Zoom, uh, and also some very important spokespeople who will um, explain the situation. So uh, I hope all you folks that are listening get a chance to, uh, to tune into that. Also, during quarantine, what is time? I mean, most of my teenagers in my community has seemed to have become nocturnal. So, you know, why not? Stay up for a good cause. <laughs> yeah, well, apparent, apparently our Israeli friends are going to be watching it, and it's 2.30 in the morning, their time, so... Yeah, Kal V'chomer, is it? <laughs> in Israel. Who needs sleep? That's right. <laughs> so if you want more information on that, I'm going to make sure it gets out to our community. And the one thing that we can be very proud of is that EHRS is the largest progressive synagogue in Europe. So that's a huge group that might be able to join and support this. And we have a long-standing tradition of Israel education and Israel advocacy. And I think this kind of initiative is exactly the kind of thing that our community could really get behind. So I have I also, high hopes. Sorry. I also understand that Hinden Reform, when it was you know, its own congregation, uh, was very generous to Magen David Adom in Israel. Uh, yes. They donated a bicycle and, and they've made other uh, contributions to, uh, to Israel. So, kola kavod. Yes, absolutely. And that actually gives me an idea that perhaps we can rope in uh, one of our emeritus rabbis, Stephen Katz, to perhaps be on hand to host a rewatch of this at a time that's more suitable for a UK audience. So I may have to take that to him because I think okay. it would be right up his, uh, right up his alley. So now that we've, we've done our plug for something that's really worthwhile, I think we need to start today with a question that actually came up during my Shabbat Babayit service this Shabbat, mm -hmm. which is a question of clarification. So there's gonna be people who are watching this live stream and many people who will be watching the recording later that will all have read the promo that we put out this past week advertising this session. And in the promo, I said that we'd be talking about Mizrahi Jews, which gives us a very logical place to start. Who are the Mizrahi Jews? Wow, okay. Let me back up from your question a little bit and sure. then I'll, I'll, I'll hit it head on. My feeling is that we need to take a look at Israel beyond the politics. We are so flooded 
with all of the political shenanigans that go on back and forth all the time. And of course, sometimes, you know, you can pull your hair out. I mean, look at me, look what happened, <laughs> right? Um, but I remember Yossi Klein Halevi, who is a very important Israeli author, he once told me, he said, if you want to understand Israeli culture, you have to listen to the soundtrack. And so I started just accumulating all of these uh, musicians and, and songwriters uh, in Israel. And that kind of led me onto a side road of uh, Mizrahi music. And what I find fascinating about it is that number one, the Mizrahi Jews uh, seem to be treated as a minority in Israel, but they're really 48% of the population, uh, which is more than the Ashkenazi uh, population by about three or 4%. Mizrahi is now the term that's used for any Jews who come from Arab lands. We, we used to use the term Sephardi, Sfarad meaning Spain, and we still use that for people who can trace it uh, directly to Spain. But of course, when the Inquisition and the expulsion came, a lot of Jews fled all across North Africa. And so now Mizrahi Jews, literally meaning Eastern, go all the way, let's say from Morocco, all the way across North Africa into Iraq and Iran and Egypt and Yemen uh, uh, in the south. And um, Mizrahi is also used uh, for Jews in the stands uh, as well. So very often it's Jews uh, who are from a Muslim culture uh, that are called Mizrahi. Uh, often Arabic is their, is their native tongue and they bring a, um, a very interesting Middle Eastern culture um, into the Israeli mainstream. Now that sounds weird, doesn't it? I mean, Israel is a Middle Eastern country, and yet a lot of its culture in its development was Western European, and that was deliberate. Ben-Gurion wanted to see Israel as a, a European, democratic, uh, Western country. And of course, it's done beautifully in that regard and uh, has expressed a tremendous creativity. But now that Mizrahi Jews are coming into their own, I think that creativity is just enhanced. And I'll show you some examples of that if you like. Speaking of music, it, it's worth mm -hmm. us pointing out that you can see Israel's affiliation to Europe in one rather quirky place, which I didn't really know about until I moved here. And that is, of course, the Eurovision Song Contest. Yes. Won very recently by Netta. So not this year, but I believe last year. And you know, this is a, a question that inevitably gets asked to me, why is Israel in the Eurovision Song Contest? And I think that there is a little part of that, the answer and the fact that, well, you know, the dream for Israel was this very particular thing. And a lot of the culture as it was growing up was aspiring to this very European sort of ideal. And it's interesting that the, their entry this year was a, a young Ethiopian woman. Mm. So, uh, that's interesting in and of itself, yeah. Yeah. So I have a piece of music that I can play if you like. Yes, please. All right, I'll just give you a little bit of background. The name of the uh, singer-songwriter is Kobi Oz. Kobi is short for Yaakov. He uh, was born in Tunisia, and then he and his family emigrated to Israel uh, when he was still a child. And um, in this song that I'm going to play for you, he is singing with his grandfather, who uh, was a Tunisian rabbi. Uh, he taped the rabbi singing a Tunisian piyut, which is kind of like a medieval poem that you often find in the prayer book, especially around high holidays. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a Tunisian melody that he's singing. And then Kobi O's layers on top of that, his own prayer, I think is what you could call it with his own melody. So I think it's probably the only time that his grandfather sang to the accompaniment of a bass guitar and drums. But anyway, uh, I, I'm going to play it now and then I'll, I'll try and uh, explain a little bit more later. But um, the piyut will be in Hebrew um, and it's simple, pure and simple praise of God. What I'd like to discuss afterward is what exactly are, the, are his lyrics, Kobi Oz's mm -hmm. lyrics trying to say? And I think there's more than one answer to that. So I'm going to put up the words first. Um, here we are. 
I hope you'll be able to see it in a sec. There they are. All right, and now I'm going to start the music. And away we go. <laughs> I think it's a very touching song. And yeah. uh, I'll, I'll explain why it's even more so. I heard uh, Kobe Oz in concert. And uh, he was saying that um, in Tunisia, when they moved to Israel, as he was, I guess when he was approaching the age of 13, uh, his grandfather said, uh, I hope I live to see your bar mitzvah and I'm going to be so proud of you on that day. And Kobe Oz answered him saying, you know, Saba, we're now living in Israel. We're secular. Who needs a bar mitzvah? That's old fashioned. And he didn't have one. And then his grandfather died. And he started looking into this traditional music and everything else. Uh, I mean, he had taken enough pains to record it uh, while the grandfather was alive. And so he told us that evening that he had composed this song 
um, to apologize for his to his grandfather and, and to compensate for uh, his not having a bar mitzvah. So I think we were all just yeah. totally teary eyed when we heard that. Uh, but you can see that there's an element of protest in this song. I mean, he has a beautiful taste for irony. Uh, and, and, and you can see it here. My favorite line in, in the song is where he says that we can all be together in this great synagogue called Eretz Yisrael. What a beautiful image that is. Um, and here everyone is welcome to look at the sky. And what do you see when you look at the sky? Well, you pray for rain, but you're also afraid that missiles are coming down and it's both. And, and, and that's kind of what it means to live in Israel. But he also talks about um, God, can you please give regards to my grandfather? And he was such a moderate man uh, in his Sephardi or Mizrahi way. And now we're, we're living in a land of extremism. So there is an element of protest in this song. And he is expressing the hope that uh, the blending of these cultures can also uh, produce a blend of uh, understanding uh, among Israelis and of course, uh, among us as well. So I think through the music, this gives me an inroad into Israel that is creative, productive, and progressive. Mm. I think there's also something really wonderful that I certainly, I experienced and I watched my classmates not experience while I did my year in Israel, which is we had a relatively peaceful time there was only one explosion while I was there, oh, which, you know, the fact that I can say that is bizarre enough on its own. And I remember when it happened very clearly because my parents were actually visiting Israel at the time. They were in Tel Aviv with family. And I was in a coffee shop with a friend of mine and I don't know if I should say this, but we kind of uh, were playing hooky <laughs> um, because we had a big test coming up. And so we went and we decided to study for this subject that we weren't doing as well in than this other. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We were in a coffee shop and suddenly we start hearing sirens and looking out the front of the coffee shop, we see seven police cars, one after another, followed by four ambulances, one after another followed by fire trucks, one after another. And we think, oh, that's unusual. And then sitting in the cafe, everybody's phone starts ringing. Everybody's. And I had my phone in my bag, so I wasn't really paying attention. His phone was on the table and it was buzzing and he kept clicking ignore and ignore and ignore. And finally he picked it up. And that's when we heard that there had been this explosion. And because we weren't where we were supposed to be, people wanted to check in and make sure that we were okay, which is exactly what was going on for everyone else in the cafe. Later that night, I called a friend of mine while I was on my way home to see if she wanted to go out for a cup of coffee. And she said, what are you talking about? Why aren't you at home? And I said, why? why would I be at home? You know, it's a regular day. I fancy a cup of coffee, just thought I'd call and ask since you're nearby. And she said, you need to go home. You shouldn't be in public. It's dangerous. And that was very much her experience. It wasn't mine. For some reason, I, I, it didn't really impact me the way it impacted a lot of my classmates. And that line about, I give requests and requests and requests, but every, really everything is all fine. That line alongside, we're all afraid of missiles, just tells you a lot about what it's like to live in Israel because you have to become used to it or you can't live there. But becoming used to it does something to you. There, that isn't something that you can have without consequence. Yeah, and, and you know, it's a common uh, phenomenon in Israel that, um, families will have children where the eldest and the youngest are 17, 18 years apart. And often the reason for that is when the eldest child is about to enter the army, the couple has an insurance child. Yeah. 
uh, because you don't know what's going to happen. I, I, I mean, it's a way of life that, that, that we can only see from the outside, but um, there's yeah. a certain element of bravery in that. No. And I think it's an important context for everything that we talk about to remember the day-to-day -day experience and how it differs from ours so that we can try, and I think a lot of what this is going to be is to try and put yourself in someone else's shoes and to really think as they would think, what would I be like if I was in that situation? What would it be like for me? So that you can understand the other's experience. That it's beautiful, beautiful piece of poetry. Now, I think how that plays out in the diaspora is Jews around the world have a whole spectrum of opinions about Israel, what it should do regarding the peace process, the Palestinians, the territories, uh, religious uh, pluralism, and a host of other issues. And that's good. Uh, I mean, we have a spectrum of opinions about our own politics, so why shouldn't we have that uh, regarding Israel as well? The key, however, is that the louder we speak, the less we listen. Mm -hmm. And so somehow we have to get to the point where we say, I can listen to the other point of view, even though I disagree with it, I must treat the speaker with respect and at least enter the same room and, uh, and have an open conversation about it. So I, I think that's where we really need to get. And, and Emily, I'm sure that's exactly what you're doing within your congregation to foster uh, that kind of open dialogue. So important. Yeah. Shall we move on to another? Okay, surprise me. <laughs> so we've discussed a little bit about who the Mizrahi are. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit from your sort of exploration, your ideas, your experience in Israel, and also because I know you just happen to be one of the best Israel educators I know, why do you think it might be, or what are the factors that are involved that may have started to change that moderate generation that may have come, not all of them would have been, um, into something that is a little bit more extreme, more zealous, what is it that's taking place that's causing that to happen? Are you talking about among Mizrahim or among the general yeah. among Mizrahim? I, th there's some interesting history to that. As I mentioned, they were kind of treated as second-class citizens. Um, there's even articles in Israeli newspapers going back to the early 50s saying that they're barbaric, they're drunkards, mm -hmm. they're illiterate. I mean, just horrible things. Right. I, I mean, we have our own racial minorities uh, about whom, you know, our cultures have said the same thing. Um, so it happened in Israel, too. And the ruling parties like Mapai and, uh, you know, that later be, uh, became Labour, uh, etc., cetera, uh, were staunchly Ashkenazic. And Mizrahim really didn't have a chance to make inroads in that party. When Menachem Begin became head of the Likud party in the election campaign of 1977, which he won, he reached out to the Mizrahi population. And he said, you too are part of Israel and I value your contribution. And a lot of Mizrahi Jews flocked uh, to his point of view, not because necessarily they held his right wing views, but because they were acknowledged. And then later on in the early eighties, the Shas party started. Uh, there's a great movie, by the way, called The, the Unorthodox, um, which talks about the, the uh, creation of this party. Um, I think Temple Sinai in Toronto is going to be showing it Saturday night. So if you go onto their website, uh, I think you can click on it. And once again, you folks in the UK can watch it in the middle of the night. But uh, um, it started as a Mizrahi religious party. And so a lot of Mizrahim uh, flocked to that. And we have to understand that in, his, in Mizrahi culture, there's not a hard and fast divide between secular and religious. So basically that means that even though you're not ultra-Orthodox yourself, you can subscribe to that party because your culture is being uh, acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So 
that's certainly why they started joining. And then the Shas party started welcoming in uh, more of the quote unquote secular Mizrahim. And, and once again, that was a right wing party, but the main attraction was they recognize our culture. So this is really, if we think about it, going back to about 1950, when Israel is starting to really increase its population in absolutely huge numbers. And I think there's a sort of understanding amongst most people that yes, Israel took all of these people in, but I'm not sure there's an understanding of what happened to those people when they came. So maybe could we just describe a little bit of what sure. people would have found when they actually got to Israel? Yeah, very, very often uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, Mizrahi Jews, most of whom were, uh, were, were, were not wealthy, um, they, they had fled from their Arab countries. They were placed in transit camps called Ma'abarot. Now, they weren't the only ones. There were Ashkenazim there, too. But uh, there was definitely a pecking order in those Ma'abarot. It was the Ashkenazim that got the work first. Um, and the Mizrahim, once again, were, were kind of seen as uh, second-class citizens. When I was a student in Israel in 1970-71, that's when the Black Panther Party uh, was created. Uh, the name, of course, was borrowed from the American Black Movement, but the Israeli Mizrahim felt that it was the same thing, you know, fist in the air, uh, a Black Power sort of thing, and that they should be recognized. Golda Meir looked at the Black Panthers and just simply said, Hemlo Nechmadim, they're not nice. And so it really was a misunderstanding of what they wanted, what they were trying to do. So I was in Israel a year and a half ago, and I met up with this incredible guy, Avraham Abergil, uh, who was one of the Black Panthers in 1970-71. So it was like, you know, meeting this, this legend. And uh, he told us, there was a group that were uh, interviewing him, that when he came to Israel in the early 50s from Morocco, um, they were giving him an Israeli passport under the law of return. And he said, great, you know, I'm sure you'll stamp my passport Jew. And they said, no, no, we're going to stamp it Moroccan. We're not going to, we're not going to call you a Jew. Uh, so he fought and fought over that. And finally, somewhere just after the Six Day War, he decided to march into the immigration office, the passport office, once again, with his passport and with a press crew behind him, with the cameras rolling. And he went up to the paquid at the desk and he said, okay, are you going to uh, give me uh, a passport that says Jew? Uh, and the clerk looked at all the uh, reporters and said, oh, of course, sir. And that's <laughs> when he became an Israeli Jewish citizen, but he had to fight for it. And now he's involved in an organization for equitable housing uh, for any uh, vulnerable population. So he's kept his ideals and it was really a pleasure to meet him. I think but one of the a, things that- the battle they've had, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, I, I think one of the things that we, we talked about and we had a, a little Zoom session to decide what we were going to have you teach on because anyone who saw that introduction will know there's a lot of things you could have taught. Um, but there is something very interesting about the time that we're living in. The focus of the news has, has turned slightly away from the pandemic. It's still very much there. It's still very much a factor in our day-to-day -day lives. Sadly, our community continues to lose people to this horrible, horrible illness. But there's something, there's another layer on top of it now, which is these conversations around what's called systemic racism. And when you're deeply embedded in a culture as a, as a person with white skin, I think it's very easy for us to not be able to see the systemic racism, not understand what systemic racism actually means and how it functions in society. But I think what you've just taught is actually exactly what the definition of systemic racism would be. Mm -hmm. The fact that the Mizrahi show up to these camps with some Ashkenazi, there's an Ashkenazi minority, a Sephardi majority, and 
the Ashkenazim get work first and a pecking order. These are the way things work. And it sets up this imbalance between these two groups who are fighting for the same things. I had, uh, when I was in Jerusalem, I had a brilliant teacher named David Levine at Hebrew Union College who taught second temple period of history. Now this, I am a huge nerd, love second temple period. I absolutely adore it. It's my favorite. And he asked us to name the groups of people that were around at that time. And I got very excited, threw my hand up and he said, all right, who was there? And I said, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes and the political zealots. And he said, great, and who else? And I was like, no, I did it. G give me my A plus and a gold star. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you the right answer. And he said, yeah, and everybody else. Most people would not have easily fit into one group or the other. What you're talking about is the political elite. Most people, whether it's now or then, wanted food, shelter, an ability to provide for their family, an ability to have a family and to have some safety and security. That's what everybody wants. And how you get that will you know, change the course of your life and lead to some people living a very different way to others, but we all have the same basic needs. And so when you put people in a position where they're competing for the same opportunities, but one group is prioritized over another, I think we can say that that is what we could define as systemic racism, which was very much alive in Israel at that time. And I think the next step is to go beyond romanticizing it. So I'll give you an example. In, in North America, um, black culture really had a boost with uh, Motown and all the music that came out of there. And of course it permeated the UK as well. Uh, but as popular as the music was, black people were still being suppressed, certainly uh, in the South of the, uh, of the United States, but not only there, uh, and probably uh, in, in many English speaking cultures. So the same thing I think is happening to Mizrahi culture uh, that uh, it's interesting now, if you go to a wedding in Israel, the band isn't playing Simon Tov and Mazel Tov and Hava Nagila. It's playing basically all Mizrahi music. And people love it and they dance to it and they crave it. But now we have to get beyond, oh, isn't this music wonderful? And isn't this culture vibrant to the individual people within that culture deserve their place under the sun just as much as we do. I mean, the whole thing going on now with Black Lives Matter um, is all about that. Yeah. And I think you can apply that same process to Mizrahi culture in Israel now. So really interestingly, this past Tuesday, I was teaching our bar mitzvah term fours, which is we have a five term bar mitzvah program that uh, students study in. When they get to that fourth term, their teacher is generally me. Sometimes it switches off with Marion Cohen, who you may know because she happens oh. to be related to a member of Salel. Yes, please say a big hello for me, okay. I will, she may actually be watching. Um, and she's, she's filling in for me occasionally, but most of the time it's me. And on Tuesday, the topic we've now got to, we study theology, is God's body. What does God look like? And so we looked at a vast range of pictures of art going back to the 15th century to try and identify what, what has God looked like to society. And they caught on very quickly to the fact that God is primarily male. Now, of course, most of these were painted by Christians and mostly Catholics at that. God is male. God is usually painted very old, beard, white hair, often in the sky. But the other thing that they did notice was that God was always white. Yeah. And we talked about how when some people read Genesis 1 verses 26 to 28, let us make man in our image, there was 
an understanding that it meant our image, as in these ones who don't look like us are not made in the image of man. And how theology actually has a part to play in how things have worked out over the years. But we've, my bar mitzvah students, none of them believe that God is a white man with a beard who lives in the sky. We talked about different facets of believing in God. Um, and so they, they think that their understanding of God is very different, more mature, more developed perhaps than what existed prior. So why do we not also apply that same maturity, that same development to our concept of the idea of the image of God? I am incredibly proud of our 12 year olds that they're it's able to have this conversation. Yeah. Yes. But I think there is a temptation once again for us to look at places like the States where these, these protests really are going on. And you have a leader in charge who's doing things quite provocatively and saying, well, we're not like that. That's their issue we don't really have that issue. That's not a thing here. We could say that about potentially being British or Canadian, but we can also equally say that about being Jewish. I think it, once again, what we're highlighting here is that this isn't a, an American issue, nor is it a outside society issue. What we have here is a Jewish issue. It's a British Jewish issue. It's an Israeli Jewish issue. It's everywhere. So how do we, Rabbi, how do we tackle this? What do we do? So if we've now come to this understanding, what do we do with it? That's a huge question. Uh, I'll give you a story among us presumably sophisticated uh, Jews. At a recent convention of the uh, Union for Reform Judaism in the United States, uh, there was um, one of the people who was going to be speaking at the convention. I was a black Jewish woman. She was walking down the corridor and one of the other delegates uh, approaching her said, oh, excuse me, could I ask you to send someone to clean up our room now? So there was just that presumption that she was black. She must have been part of the housekeeping staff of the hotel. So the the first part of this and it's not an easy part is to at least recognize that prejudice that we all bear and at least to bring it out into the open and, and, and to deal with it and, and i guess the other part is just to interact as long as we're living in solitudes where we don't interact with different people of different cultures of different religions then we're going to remain permanently in ignorance. Uh, it's a now a very wide open world and we have to take advantage of that, even if it's electronically for the time being, and to open ourselves up to as many different people as we can. And, and what I said earlier about the open dialogue and not being afraid to understand someone whose point of view may be different than your own. Could you tell us a little bit about, because in your introduction, I did happen to mention one thing that I, I it was, it's hard to say how incredibly essential this one particular thing was to me, which was if you ever have the chance to go to Solel, which do, if oh, you're yes. British you and you're, yeah. yeah, and you're sure. going so to Canada cool. on a visit, yeah. Go to Salel. Yes. And from the time I was very young, I have memories of walking into the building and the very first thing you would see on the right-hand side is a big wooden container, the plaque on the front that said for Food Path. Right. Which is now the Mississauga Food Bank. Still there. Mm -hmm. So... This idea of reaching out to people who are different than you, how did that take place practically within Salel in terms of advocating for equal treatment across the board and for making sure people have their necessities met? 
Since you mentioned Solel, I just have to tell you that there are several people at Solel that want to send their love to you and give you a <laughs> virtual uh, embrace. Uh, Arlene, of course, who you know well, and Eleanor and Linda. And um, I, I'm just saying this so that you know how much you are still loved uh, at Solel and so that your, your community in the UK can understand what a, what a star you are uh, and always were. Uh, I'm going to uh, match this top soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, we do shifts at the food bank. Uh, very often there are people who volunteer uh, to go there. We, we, of course, collect food all the time, but some people go and, and help distribute it. Uh, Solel has always been and still is very active in interfaith and intercultural work. So mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, now that I'm living in Toronto, I'm amazed that Mississauga is miles ahead of this big urban center in which I now live. Uh, but then of course, Mississauga is a very multicultural community. And, and so we have uh, Jews and many denominations of Christianity and Islam, uh, Baha'i, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Zoroastrian, and on and on and on it goes. And they meet uh, as an interfaith uh, council and they do work within the community. Uh, we visit each other's houses of worship. Uh, Solel, as you remember, each year has what's called an invite your neighbor service, where uh, everybody in Solel is invited, uh, is welcome to invite their interfaith neighbors and um, all people of mixed faiths uh, are welcome to come. And uh, the rabbi does a, an educational kind of service where we talk about the tenets of Judaism and, and the common values that we all share as people of faith. And uh, it's always very well attended and it still goes on. So those are a few examples. We had an invite your best friend at our religion school. We did it for Purim and it was the cutest thing I've ever seen. So all these kids brought their best friends in costume to come and have a big party. And for many of them, it was the first time they'd ever been in a synagogue. And it was so appreciated that we had even the parents of the friends coming and saying, can we come again? <laughs> can, we, can we do this again? This was really fun. And um, the clergy team at EHRS had pre-lockdown discussed doing our first ever bring your neighbor service very much based off of the Salel service because I have such fond memories of it. The other thing I remember so clearly that was so not a thing we did but so amazing to watch was the the bells the bell ringing that was from the United Church who came and uh, did that yeah where, where they amazing yeah, did the story of Noah with bells it was great yeah. Yeah amazing yeah. and just having the opportunity to be able to see these wonderful things when you talk about you know the difference between Mississauga and Toronto it's not that dissimilar to what we have here between Edgware and London if you think of where London is you've got the heart of the city here you've got to take that northern line all the way up and all the way up to it till it ends before Which you get to Edgware yes, yes. <laughs> And we also, Edgware is also incredibly diverse. There's people of all different faiths and cultures and backgrounds, ethnicities. Um, there's a huge, very, very different uh, proportion of people of different wealth and income status as well. So there's all kinds of these people in our area. And coming out of lockdown, one of the things that we need to really consider is how can we best engage with all of these people around. Um, it's something that's incredibly exciting. As a community that has done this in different kind of uh, spurts, let's say, sometimes it's been really active, sometimes it's been less active. Again, at the moment, because of the situation, it's been basically non-existent. So if you think back to Solel, way back when, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it was Ella Stock oh, yes. who first saw the newspaper article about what needed to be done for the area and came in and said, yeah. this has to stop. What advice would you give us 
if we are now at a we need to do something moment what how would you advise us to go ahead as someone who's done it very successfully well I, I would make one suggestion that we have some excellent teachers already in our midst and that's our children and grandchildren mm -hmm. i'll tell you a story um there was one kid at solel who was in grade first grade and he came home with a class picture and he said, he showed it to his parents and he said, look, mom, dad, uh, these are my classmates and, and we're all in this picture together. And here's my best friend, Todd. And he pointed to the picture and his father said, oh, I see that Todd is East Asian. And the little boy said, dad, how did you know? So that's, that's what it is, okay, that, um, if our kids aren't infused with all of these stereotypes and pre prejudices to begin with, then they can really help us overcome ours. And uh, I, I think if we listen to them, they can be some really good teachers. I personally, I mean, after my class with my 12 year olds, uh, talking about what's the right way to do things and who we should be listening to. I think they're more often right than they are wrong. So I'm very much behind that. Very nice. So it's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you today. We've covered a lot of ground. Hopefully we've sparked a little bit of interest for people to look into some Mizrahi music and to really examine it a little bit more than I like this tune but to actually become familiar with the people behind it and their stories. Um, I am very happy for any of the Edgeware people to continue this conversation, especially if you're interested in learning about Israel between let's say 1948 and 1953. I would be more than happy to teach a regular, maybe a three week, two hour session each time course so that we can talk about some of the issues that came up in that original part of, of the state's life. Um, and then perhaps at some point we need to take a look and have a session on that 1977 election victory by Menachem Begin because that was not a close call. Right. That election was a huge moment. It was a landslide victory and it changed Israel dramatically. And if you want to understand Israel, you first have to do that first piece of the early years. And then you have to look at that in contrast to what happened in 77. And until you do that, I think it's very, very hard to understand where Israel is now. Just to throw something into the mix, it's also interesting to look at the Israel Declaration of Independence, which has apparently has no legal status in Israel. It is not a constitution, mm. but it does serve, especially within the reform and progressive movements, as a statement of ideals towards which Israel is to become. So that could really be a beacon in, in terms of what direction uh, Israel can go and how we can help it go there. Yeah, so one more time on that, because this is so important that we have a part to play in this. Yes. Can you tell us once again about your event that's coming up on the 18th? Okay, it's called We Rise Up for Israel for um, Israel Reform Judaism. And there is, uh, if you wish to donate to it, there, there is a, a place where you can uh, click to donate. Uh, and we're accepting uh, international currency. <laughs> And it's basically to go into the personnel and programs in the reform movement in Israel. It's to help uh, rabbis stay employed. It's to help synagogues keep their lights on. But it's also going to help the humanitarian programs that the reform movement engages in to keep going. For example, one of them is called Karen Bekavod, where they have a summer camp experience for children with cancer where they go into vulnerable neighborhoods and distribute food and supplies. Um, there's also an organization where they have dialogue with Palestinian neighbors. So there's all these outreach programs that the Reform Israel movement is doing as well. 
And by our supporting them, we are helping to bring the ideals of the Declaration of Independence to reality. So it's just more than giving money to um, salaries and, and synagogues, although that's important. It's really what those people and organizations can do. Absolutely. So thank you so much for spending an hour with us. It was such a treat for me <laughs> and Fantastic. for all the people that were watching. And God willing, maybe we'll be able to uh, borrow a little bit more of your time for a session later on. You never know. <laughs> and In the meantime, for members of uh, Hendon and Edgeway Reform, you take good care of Rabbi Emily <laughs> and you'll reap the rewards. And not only that, but if you're ever in Mississauga, actually, before we go, I want to tell one story because it was very, very funny to me. I was at a synagogue in North London. I'm not going to say exactly where because the first part of what I'm going to say isn't terribly flattering. Um, it was a smallish community. There was only about 20 people there. I was doing a musical service for them. And because it was rather small, it was very obvious that two of the members were not so much as listening as they were talking to each other and they were whispering and pointing at me. And I thought, it's very rude. <laughs> Why would you do this? But I continued singing and leading the service and everything was fine. But I, I kept noticing that this was continuing all throughout. So the service ends and these two people come up to me and they say, you know, that was a lovely service. We really enjoyed the music. Thank you very much. And I said, well, thank you for, for coming and participating. And they said, just out of curiosity, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm, I'm from Canada. And they said, yeah, where in Canada? And I said, Ontario. And they said, you yeah, where in Ontario? And I said, just outside of Toronto. And I'm thinking, why do you keep that? Why is this getting so... Uh, and they said, we're just outside of Toronto. And I said, Mississauga? And they went, we knew it. You're from Solel. We were there last week. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. So what they'd noticed was that I was using tunes that I'd learned from Solel and I was <laughs> using them in this community. Isn't that true? And so all that that whispering and pointing was just them being excited <laughs> that they knew the tunes. <laughs> and they had family, just like Marion Kona's family as well. They had family at Salel and they had been there for a bar mitzvah. So we have very close links between us and you. Um, and one day, God willing, I hope to be able to welcome you into our sanctuary and be able to share Shabbat with you. That would be a delight, but it is such a privilege to have this conversation with you, Emily, and uh, uh, kol for all the th wonderful things that you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Well, take care, and thanks, everyone, for watching, and we hope that you have a fantastic week, and we look forward to seeing you at our Shabbat services Friday night. We have 4.15 Cuddle Up Shabbat, 6.30 Ma'ariv, and 8 o'clock. Friday Night Light Song Session, Saturday morning, we have our 9.15 Torah Breakfast, 10.30 Beit Tefillah Service, and 11 a.m. Shabbat Babait. Please join in as much as you can, and I'll be back again on Monday for your Monday morning meetup. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>